18, The Night of Wrestling. This chapter is based on Genesis 32 and 33. Though Jacob had left Paden Aram in obedience to the divine direction, it was not without many misgivings that he retraced the road which he had trodden as a fugitive twenty years before. His sin in the deception of his father was ever before him. He knew that his long exile was the direct result of that sin, and he pondered over these things day and night, the reproaches of an accusing conscience making his journey very sad. As the hills of his native land appeared before him, in the distance, the heart of the patriarch was deeply moved. All the past rose vividly before him. With the memory of his sin came also the thought of God's favor toward him and the promises of divine help and guidance. As he drew nearer his journey's end, the thought of Esau brought many a troubled foreboding. After the flight of Jacob, Esau had regarded himself as the sole heir of their father's possessions. The news of Jacob's return would excite the fear that he was coming to claim the inheritance. Esau was now able to do his brother great injury, if so disposed, and he might be moved to violence against him, not only by the desire for revenge, but in order to secure undisturbed possession of the wealth which he had so long looked upon as his own. Again the Lord granted Jacob a token of the divine care. As he traveled southward from Mount Gilead, Two hosts of heavenly angels seemed to encompass him behind and before, advancing with his company as if for their protection. Jacob remembered the vision at Bethel so long before, and his burdened heart grew lighter at this evidence that the divine messengers who had brought him hope and courage at his flight from Canaan were to be the guardians of his return. And he said, This is God's host, and he called the name of that place Mahanaim two hosts, or camps. Yet Jacob felt that he had something to do to secure his own safety. He therefore dispatched messengers with a conciliatory greeting to his brother. He instructed them as to the exact words in which they were to address Esau. It had been foretold before the birth of the two brothers that the elder should serve the younger, and lest the memory of this should be a cause of bitterness, Jacob told the servants they were sent to my Lord Esau. When brought before him, they were to refer to their master as thy servant Jacob, and to remove the fear that he was returning, a destitute wanderer, to claim the paternal inheritance, Jacob was careful to state in his message, I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find grace in thy sight. But the servants returned with the tidings that Esau was approaching with four hundred men, and no response was sent to the friendly message. It appeared certain that he was coming to seek revenge. Terror pervaded the camp. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He could not go back, and he feared to advance. His company, unarmed and defenseless, were wholly unprepared for a hostile encounter. He accordingly divided them into two bands— so that if one should be attacked, the other might have an opportunity to escape. He sent from his vast flocks generous presents to Esau with a friendly message. He did all in his power to atone for the wrong to his brother and to avert the threatened danger, and then in humiliation and repentance he pleaded for divine protection. Thou saidst unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies, and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children." They had now reached the river Jabbok, and as night came on, Jacob sent his family across the ford of the river, while he alone remained behind. He had decided to spend the night in prayer, and he desired to be alone with God. God could soften the heart of Esau. In him was the patriarch's only hope. It was in a lonely, mountainous region, the haunt of wild beasts, and the lurking place of robbers and murderers. Solitary and unprotected, Jacob bowed in deep distress upon the earth. 
It was midnight. All that made life dear to him were at a distance, exposed to danger and death. Bitterest of all was the thought that it was his own sin which had brought this peril upon the innocent. With earnest cries and tears he made his prayer before God. Suddenly a strong hand was laid upon him. He thought that an enemy was seeking his life, and he endeavored to wrest himself from the grasp of the assailant. In the darkness the two struggled for the mastery. Not a word was spoken, but Jacob put forth all his strength and did not relax his efforts for a moment. While he was thus battling for his life, the sense of his guilt pressed upon his soul. His sins rose up before him to shut him out from God. But in his terrible extremity he remembered God's promises, and his whole heart went out in entreaty for his mercy. The struggle continued until near the break of day, when the stranger placed his finger upon Jacob's thigh, and he was crippled instantly. The patriarch now discerned the character of his antagonist. He knew that he had been in conflict with a heavenly messenger, and this was why his almost superhuman effort had not gained the victory. It was Christ, the angel of the covenant, who had revealed himself to Jacob. The patriarch was now disabled and suffering the keenest pain, but he would not loosen his hold. All penitent and broken, he clung to the angel. He wept and made supplication. Hosea chapter 12, verse 4 pleading for a blessing. He must have the assurance that his sin was pardoned. Physical pain was not sufficient to divert his mind from this object. His determination grew stronger, his faith more earnest and persevering until the very last. The angel tried to release himself. He urged, Let me go, for the day breaketh. But Jacob answered, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Had this been a boastful, presumptuous confidence, Jacob would have been instantly destroyed. But his was the assurance of one who confesses his own unworthiness, yet trusts the faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God. Jacob had power over the angel and prevailed. Hosea chapter 12, verse 4. Through humiliation, repentance, and self-surrender, this sinful, erring mortal prevailed with the majesty of heaven. He had fastened his trembling grasp upon the promises of God, and the heart of infinite love could not turn away the sinner's plea. The error that had led to Jacob's sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud was now clearly set before him. He had not trusted God's promises, but had sought by his own efforts to bring about that which God would have accomplished in his own time and way. As an evidence that he had been forgiven, his name was changed from one that was a reminder of his sin to one that commemorated his victory. Thy name, said the angel, shall be called no more Jacob, the supplanter, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Jacob had received the blessing for which his soul had longed. His sin as a supplanter and deceiver had been pardoned. The crisis in his life was past. Doubt, perplexity, and remorse had embittered his existence. But now all was changed, and sweet was the peace of reconciliation with God. Jacob no longer feared to meet his brother. God, who had forgiven his sin, could move the heart of Esau also to accept his humiliation and repentance. While Jacob was wrestling with the angel, another heavenly messenger was sent to Esau. In a dream, Esau beheld his brother for twenty years in exile from his father's house. He witnessed his grief at finding his mother dead. He saw him encompassed by the hosts of God. This dream was related by Esau to his soldiers, with the charge not to harm Jacob, for the God of his father was with him. The two companies at last approached each other the desert chief leading his men of war, and Jacob with his wives and children, attended by shepherds and handmaidens, and followed by long lines of flocks and herds. Leaning upon his staff, the patriarch went forward to meet the band of soldiers. He was pale and disabled from his recent conflict, and he walked slowly and painfully, halting at every step. 
but his countenance was lighted up with joy and peace. At sight of that crippled sufferer, Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. As they looked upon the scene, even the hearts of Esau's rude soldiers were touched. Notwithstanding he had told them of his dream, they could not account for the change that had come over their captain. Though they beheld the patriarch's infirmity, they little thought that this his weakness had been made his strength. In his night of anguish beside the Jabbok, when destruction seemed just before him, Jacob had been taught how vain is the help of man, how groundless is all trust in human power. He saw that his only help must come from him against whom he had so grievously sinned. Helpless and unworthy, he pleaded God's promise of mercy to the repentant sinner. That promise was his assurance that God would pardon and accept him. Sooner might heaven and earth pass than that word could fail, and it was this that sustained him through that fearful conflict. Jacob's experience during that night of wrestling and anguish represents the trial through which the people of God must pass just before Christ's second coming. The prophet Jeremiah, in holy vision looking down to this time, said, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. All faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 5 to 7. When Christ shall cease his work as mediator in man's behalf, then this time of trouble will begin. Then the case of every soul will have been decided, and there will be no atoning blood to cleanse from sin. When Jesus leaves his position as man's intercessor before God, the solemn announcement is made, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. Then the restraining Spirit of God is withdrawn from the earth. As Jacob was threatened with death by his angry brother, so the people of God will be in peril from the wicked who are seeking to destroy them. And as the patriarch wrestled all night for deliverance from the hand of Esau, so the righteous will cry to God day and night for deliverance from the enemies that surround them. Satan had accused Jacob before the angels of God, claiming the right to destroy him because of his sin. He had moved upon Esau to march against him, and during the patriarch's long night of wrestling, Satan endeavored to force upon him a sense of his guilt in order to discourage him and break his hold upon God. When in his distress Jacob laid hold of the angel and made supplication with tears, the heavenly messenger, in order to try his faith, also reminded him of his sin and endeavored to escape from him. But Jacob would not be turned away. He had learned that God is merciful and he cast himself upon his mercy. He pointed back to his repentance for his sin and pleaded for deliverance. As he reviewed his life, he was driven almost to despair, but he held fast the angel and with earnest, agonizing cries urged his petition until he prevailed. Such will be the experience of God's people in their final struggle with the powers of evil. God will test their faith, their perseverance, their confidence in His power to deliver them. Satan will endeavor to terrify them with the thought that their cases are hopeless, that their sins have been too great to receive pardon. They will have a deep sense of their shortcomings, and as they review their lives, their hopes will sink. But remembering the greatness of God's mercy, and their own sincere repentance, they will plead His promises made through Christ to helpless, repenting sinners. Their faith will not fail because their prayers are not immediately answered. They will lay hold of the strength of God as Jacob laid hold of the angel, and the language of their souls will be, I will not let thee go 
except thou bless me. Had not Jacob previously repented of his sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud, God could not have heard his prayer and mercifully preserved his life. So in the time of trouble, if the people of God had unconfessed sins to appear before them while tortured with fear and anguish, they would be overwhelmed. Despair would cut off their faith, and they could not have confidence to plead with God for deliverance. But while they have a deep sense of their unworthiness, they will have no concealed wrongs to reveal. Their sins will have been blotted out by the atoning blood of Christ, and they cannot bring them to remembrance. Satan leads many to believe that God will overlook their unfaithfulness in the minor affairs of life. But the Lord shows in his dealings with Jacob that he can in no wise sanction or tolerate evil. All who endeavor to excuse or conceal their sins and permit them to remain upon the books of heaven, unconfessed and unforgiven, will be overcome by Satan. The more exalted their profession and the more honorable the position which they hold, the more grievous is their course in the sight of God and the more certain the triumph of the great adversary. Yet Jacob's history is an assurance that God will not cast off those who have been betrayed into sin, but who have returned unto him with true repentance. It was by self-surrender and confiding faith that Jacob gained what he had failed to gain by conflict in his own strength. God thus taught his servant that divine power and grace alone could give him the blessing he craved. Thus it will be with those who live in the last days. As dangers surround them and despair seizes upon the soul, they must depend solely upon the merits of the atonement. We can do nothing of ourselves. In all our helpless unworthiness, we must trust in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior. None will ever perish while they do this. The long black catalog of our delinquencies is before the eye of the infinite. The register is complete. None of our offenses are forgotten. But he who listened to the cries of his servants of old will hear the prayer of faith and pardon our transgressions. He has promised, and he will fulfill his word. Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. His experience testifies to the power of importunate prayer. It is now that we are to learn this lesson of prevailing prayer, of unyielding faith. The greatest victories to the Church of Christ or to the individual Christian are not those that are gained by talent or education, by wealth or the favor of men. They are those victories that are gained in the audience chamber with God when earnest, agonizing faith lays hold upon the mighty arm of power. Those who are unwilling to forsake every sin and to seek earnestly for God's blessing will not obtain it. But all who will lay hold of God's promises as did Jacob and be as earnest and persevering as he was will succeed as he succeeded. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Luke chapter 18, verses 7 and 8.